I wanted to do this for a long time because uh, I feel that uh, George Gay was really one of the great, great uh, devotees, disciples of Master. And uh, I feel also that he, he was a realized Master, you know, before the end of his life. He was a great being and uh, certainly one of the most unrecognized ones that uh, I know of, really, except there, there's a small group of us that knew him well. I don't know how well we knew him, but uh, we knew him well enough to know that he was not just an ordinary person. And uh, it's, this is kind of an auspicious time for me because it's uh, 40, just almost exactly 43 years since I talked to Master about this. It was back in uh, November of 1951. And uh, <clears throat> Master wanted me to, to meet, uh, there, there were four, four people that he wanted me to not just meet, but to associate with at that time. And uh, one of them was, of course, uh, Rajasi, Mr. Lin. And the other was Dr. Lewis, whom I'd already met. <coughs> and uh, Mr. Black, who I sub subsequently met. And then, uh, then he said, towards the end, he said, uh, by the way, I want you to, uh, to meet this George Gay. He, meet George. He, he lives right down near you. And I said, yes, Master, where is that? He said, uh, well, he, he lives in Milwaukee. I said, Milwaukee, that's not near me. That's a, that's a long ways away. He said, that's okay. He says, you, you just get in your airplane. You go down and see him. <laughs> and uh, I said, all right, Master. And, and he said, just a minute. I'll get Faye to give you the address. And so Faye got, gave me the address. And, and uh, so I promised Master I'd go down and see him. And I thought, I thought, you know, Master had made me a minister of, of SRF. And uh, I thought, well, gee, uh, he wants me to go down and help George. And so uh, I, uh, I said, well, Master, I'll, I'll do this just as soon as I could, can. And so uh, a few weeks later, I called down there, and I got a hold of this funny-sounding voice. And uh, you have to remember that in those days, George... Uh, he did a lot of meditation. And what he would do, he'd get up, he, he had an old chair he had up in the loft in his uh, house there. And it was an old ramshackled house. I don't know if that, is that house still there? No. It's, it's down, huh? Anyway, uh, it was, a, and uh, so uh, <clears throat> he, couldn't, he couldn't really talk very well. It's funny, you know, if somebody stays in silence all the time, uh, it's hard for them to get the words out. And he'd sort of uh, chop off his sentences, and he was really kind of hard to understand. But anyway, he said that he'd meet me at the airport in Milwaukee. And, uh, and Master said, well, you just get in your little airplane, you go down there and see him. So I did. I went down there, and, and I got to the airport, and, and uh, th then I there was this funny looking guy and he had his old coonskin hat on. <laughs> he was all wrapped up and uh, and, I, I, and we sat alone and, and he, he just kind of smiled. He didn't say too much and we got in his car and uh, we went out to his house and uh, when I walked into the house, boy, everything was in shambles. I mean, there were bread crumbs, uh, bread, old dried pieces of bread all over the counter. And uh, there was, he had this whole, this old pot-bellied stove that he put wood in. And uh, this place was really a wreck. It looked like it needed some house cleaning and things like that. And I thought, boy, this guy really needs some help. I can see that. <laughs> it was a mess, just a, little, a real mess. And so... Uh, I said, well, okay, and, and uh, 
Then, then we, we talked a little bit. We, I couldn't get much out of him, but it was getting late at night, and he said, uh, Bob, you go up and uh, you sleep up in my, up in my bed, up in the, in the lower, up in the loft there. It wasn't really a bed. He had a kind of a chair up there, but there was a, there, I think there was a mattress there. I'd forgotten what it was. And uh, I was thinking about this whole thing, and I thought, boy, this fellow really needs some help. He can hardly talk. He, he, he's just a real mess. And so then I, 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 it was getting late, and I laid down in the bed, and I, and uh, boy, something just hit me like a ton of bricks, and I just, oh boy, I could just, I just got a flash of, of what he was or who he was, and I said, boy, I'm the guy that really needs the help here, <laughs> and and uh, I had, after that, I had a lot of respect for him. And uh, she was so beautiful, and uh, I forgot now what, whether, you know, he was telling me how he'd met Master. And uh, I think a lot of you have probably heard this story, and uh, as I remember it, he said that he was walking down the streets in Milwaukee one day, and uh, he saw this uh, funny looking guy coming towards him. He had a cane, and he had kind of a turban on his head. And he was walking towards him, and Master was just, you know, Master was coming down towards him, and he just staring at him. George was staring at him, and you know, and his eyes were glued on him. And uh, as he walked by him, as Master walked by him, and he walked by Master, well, George turned around to look at him. And Master just took his cane and he he pointed it at him. And he said, you come to the meeting tonight. And George didn't know what he was talking about or anything. And uh, so then he kept on, George kept on walking. And uh, just a few minutes later, he saw this uh, bill or this advertisement uh, posted on this, this pole. And it told about Swami Yogananda was going to be at such and such a place giving this lecture in the evening. And so uh, uh, George went to the to the lecture, and there were, you know, in those days, Master used to attract big uh, groups of people. And uh, he was uh, George was sitting way in the back somewhere, and uh, as 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 Master was, and they were doing some chanting, and then Master did his talk. And uh, when they finished, uh, Master looked into the audience and he said, uh, probably out of this whole group of people that are here, there may be one or two that get this self-realization. And you know, it says in the Gita, out of thousands and thousands that seek me, two or three are serious enough to, to really find me, or something to that extent. And so George was sitting there. He said, praying, you know, that that he would be one of the one of the two or whatever that would find this self-realization, that would have this realization. And sure enough, he did. He really he really had it. And uh, I had so many wonderful times with him. You know, there weren't. Uh, there, it's all kind of a blur right now with, with all all the things that we did together. But he would he would come up to Minnesota, and then we'd ride out in my airplane to the to the convocation in in Los Angeles. In those days, there were probably two two about maybe a hundred people at the most, probably seventy five people. Now I think they had about seventy five hundred people. I think at the last one that they they just had. But in those days, uh, you know, it was it was so uh, so different, and there was no uh, formality. We were just all kind of friends, you know, like we are here. And we, we we just all get together, and we we we'd enjoy this consciousness of Master's presence together. And I remember one time we we stopped in, uh, we flew. Out, he, George came to my house in St. Paul, 
And then we climbed in my airplane, we, and we were going to fly to Los Angeles, and we, we stopped in Albuquerque. And we, we went to this motel, and uh, I remember going to bed in one room, and George, we had connecting rooms or something like that, and the door was open. And uh, I remember going to bed, and about two, two or three o'clock in the morning, I just woke up, and I sat up, and I just, I just went right into meditation. I couldn't understand what was happening. And all of a sudden, I saw George. He was walking back and forth between our two rooms. You know, and this, this fellow was just in a state of ecstasy. He just was, was so incredibly beautiful. And uh, uh, I, I just can't tell you, uh, every t I, I just look forward to being with him because the, just being with him was enough to, to make you feel that inner realization. And in those days, uh, I, just, I, I just sought any excuse to be with Rajasi or Dr. Lewis and uh, those that had really, you know, had, the, had this re realization and experienced this realization. And uh, so George was, was so very, very special and uh, such an incredible being. And uh, I, I just, uh, I just feel that uh, I think now is the time for him to be really recognized in this in this world. He's been one of the best kept secrets. Dr. Lewis used to call him Saint George, and uh, Dr. Ju Dr. <coughs> Lewis could really really understand who he was. He was one of the few people that did, except those that. Uh, came out to be with him, you know, in, in the early days. So I wanted uh, to have uh, this several people that I want to talk about him. And Mary D., who's, who is, I've known for a long, long time and in California. She used to come to my meditation groups there, and her, we had a very close, wonderful group there. And uh, there was also a friend of her, Sylvia. I think Sylvia went out to see George first. And then she started to spread the word to Mary D. and a few others. And then Mary D. went out to see him. And I know Haley went out to see him in those days. And uh, so I'd like you to come up, uh, Mary D., and, and uh, tell us about you. You've spent a lot of close time with him, because you lived with him, I think, or lived around there for a long oh. time. <clears throat> but I want you to come up here so that we can tape this. <laughs> so. Well, I, I've been, ever since, I'm just, first of all, I want to say I'm, how thrilled I was to be invited, and how wonderful it is here to, to be here with all of you. Uh, Dr. George was such a special, special person that I hope that um, that we can really do him honor today, because he deserves more than the stories that I can tell. <laughs> but nevertheless, I, I, um, how I met him was um, at Bob's. Bob had been talking about this man that he had known um, in his early days on the path, and he said, you know. He has gone farther with this than anybody I've ever known. And he's going to be coming here. I don't know exactly the date, but when he comes, I want you all to be sure and come, because this is a rare privilege for you to meet him. And um, I was, you know, thrilled to, to hear that and wanted to come. But uh, the weeks went by, and <coughs> we didn't get any word about it, and then um, I had seen some notice in the paper about the East-West Cultural Center was going to have a seminar on dream analysis, and I thought, oh, I really want, I've been getting some really strange dreams, and I really wanted to go to that. So um, that was on Wednesday, and that was when we all went to Bob's, but I thought, well, I'll miss once, and I'll go. 
That afternoon, Don Marginson called me, and he said, Mary, are you going to Bob's tonight? And I said, no, I'm going down to the East West Cultural Center. They're having this dream class. He said, no, you're coming to Bob's. And he just was so insistent that I come to Bob's. And so I did, and Dr. George was there that night. And when he walked in, I mean, we were just all overcome. Dorothy said she was sitting in the back, and he walked up behind her, and she was just enveloped in this all-encompassing love. And that was what I remember most of all about Dr. George, that you just loved to be with him. No matter what he was doing or where he was, you just wanted to be around him. Because he had this love that just reached out and held you in. And um, so that night after both Bob talked and, I mean, we always came away from Bob's very high with just Bob there, but that night had Dr. George there, and I think Mildred Hamilton was there. It was, it was a, I mean, we were all sky high. And um, previously, Muktananda had come and had had a series of early morning meetings and that I had missed because I didn't know that I could come. And Bob had said to me once, um, why aren't you coming to the meetings? And I said, gee, Bob, I thought that was just for a special few. I didn't know it was welcome. You get yourself up here in the morning. So I did. And since that had just happened, I thought, I'm not going to miss this. So I went up to uh, see Dr. George, and um, I just fell in love with him immediately. I would have followed him anywhere. And he said, sell all your things and move to, move to Wisconsin. And sure, <laughs> it was just like that was nothing. But... Um, Later, uh, as I was getting ready to go, and uh, I made a couple of trips back there first before I actually moved. I, that was in uh, 75, right after I'd lost my, my brother, who was my closest friend, and next to me in age in the family. And um, I really, you know, was needing some help and support that that kind of being can give you. And um, Shirley, Shirley Winters, anybody? Shirley Winters came, and the two of us went up to see you at the farm. And um, those funny buildings there that, you know, later we figured out that when we were working on those old buildings, we, he was working on our egos. <laughs> so. Um, but we spent the last few days laughing at, ev at everything. It was so funny. Just didn't fit the spiritual mold. You know, you expect these placid green fields and beautiful flowers and everything. And it's just... Anyway, we loved being there anyway. You just, you just couldn't, couldn't help but just want to be with him. And, um, well, let's see. And then I came, then we came back, um, at Christmas he gave Kriya, every Christmas. And so we came back for Kriya. And um, I, I felt kind of bad about that because I had had Kriya several times from Bob, but I couldn't quite get it somehow. I, I tried and I couldn't do it. And I said, Dr. George, I, I don't do Kriya. I have had the Kriya initiation before. But I've never been able to do it. And uh, he said, don't worry about that. I want you to come. When you're ready, you'll do it. It'll just happen. So, okay. So we were, we were there for Kriya, and that was also a wonderful event. And then they went back, and then that was when he kept saying, you know, when are you coming? When are you coming? And uh, we were out on that trip. Uh, we had gone up to the farm, and um, we'd all gone out for pie and coffee. 
and we stopped this place and somebody said to me, Mary Dee, when are you moving up here? And uh, I kind of hesitated. Dr. George said, April. <laughs> so I said, I guess I'm moving in April. <laughs> so uh, just before it was time for me to come, I thought, my God, what have I done? I've quit my job. I, this fear just overwhelmed me. Uh, and what have I done? And so I quickly called Phyllis Crystal. I don't know if any of you know her, but she's really a wonderful, helpful lady. And she does a kind of reverie um, that goes in and gets to the bottom, whatever the problem is. And uh, in fact, she's written several books about it, which I highly recommend, called uh, Cutting the Ties That Bind. And um, after that, it was just wonderful. And I just prayed that, you know, I felt at first I was eager to come. But then when it came right down to it, and I, I know, this fear came over me, and I thought, well, this is ridiculous because here is an opportunity that, you know, right in your own culture to get this kind of training. Most people have to go to India, and they're in a different culture. They don't speak the language. There's so many things. But here is someone right here in this country. It's just an unbelievable opportunity. And what is the matter with you? But it was some old ties, I guess, that were severed in these... Um, uh, treatments or reveries or whatever I call them treatments, she calls them lessons, I guess, of um, cutting the ties that bind. And she has two books out, Cutting the Ties That Bind and Cutting the Ties That Bind Too. And that really helped me tremendously. And um, so I came, and it was Sylvia who came after. Um, and she she just couldn't handle it. She got so upset. <laughs> and, um, and then she got, uh, she just couldn't do it. And then she, she got so remorseful and so felt so <coughs> guilty about, what she, I don't see anything in him and so on. Blah, blah, blah. So then she was just, uh, you know, kneeling at his feet, begging forgiveness. It was that kind of a, a thing that I kind of had it with him for a while too. Uh, and I would feel so terrible that I would dare to question because he would never explain anything and I was asking millions of questions. And he'd say, don't try to understand me, you'll never be able to. And, um, but he did, you know, see me through, through a lot of things. I, I don't know, kind of, it, it's just the most important thing that Dr. George means to me is just the love. And just, you know, he, he, he made me see the importance of just being. That you didn't have to be this or that, you just had to be. And if you were just yourself and be, that was what the world wanted and what the world needed from all of us. And I am eternally grateful to the day that I met him. And uh, there, I understand same as writing a book. There are no books. There should be books about him. But I, you're going to hear some better stories from people who follow me. <laughs> I don't know who, who comes next. Debbie, you want to be next? As far as I know, Dr. George was born about 1910. He was pretty vague about it. His mother died at birth, and then his father remarried, and then his father died, and then there was another, a couple more marriages there. Pretty soon he was on the streets at eight years old. We tell you that because anybody can go. Anybody can do the work. It's, 
opportunity is always there. He uh, remembers, he says he remembers being in his mother's womb and kicking like heck because he didn't want to be there. He didn't want to come back. And he remembers at two years old, he had a vision of himself. He saw himself with doing his work at the end, but he kept waiting and waiting and it never seemed to happen. He tried twice to start a church and it wouldn't start. So the third time he had it, his first place of worship was an old barn, a small one, but it was old. It had a dirt floor. He had an old, the guts of an old furnace for heat. And he had, a, the altar was built out of uh, charred timbers that he'd gotten out of a fire. And he had the pictures of the masters on the altar with old rusty paint cans. And at the end of the altar was a, an old used toilet. Why, I never did know. <laughs> <laughs> there was uh, cobwebs in the windows, no curtains, and every time it rained, the place filled up with water. It was, uh, he would always call up and we would get a crew together and bail water. We had carried out, the, it was in a little hollow, we carried that out. We couldn't get it all out because it had a dirt floor so it was muddy anyway. We could put cement blocks around and a planks and then you'd grab a floating chair and, <laughs> and if you couldn't sit cross-legged you were in trouble. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there was a, his house was about 50 feet away and there was an upper porch on the house. And after we would have a service, we would go to this upper porch and have a little hot chocolate and he would talk to us. In the summer, that porch was very hot because it was all glassed in and quite drafty. And it was hot and full of mosquitoes. And in the winter, I remember looking at the thermometer one day and it was 10 below in that room. And here we are, all with our coats on, listening. And he, he never did say much. He never taught with words. Very rarely. A little bit, but not much. Mostly it was consciousness. One day, it rained pretty heavy. And uh, I said, I called him up and I said, are we going to bail water today? He said, no, not today. He said, uh, Blessed Mother, or Divine Mother, he said, said, that's enough of that. We don't have to do that anymore. And there was never another drop of water, not a drop, ever again. And I know three people were there when we tore that building down to look for, see if somebody would come in in the middle of the night and put tile around. And there was never any tile. So that was the first experience I had with him. But he told me once, he said, I meditated five hours a day for 12 years. And he says, I was doing it all wrong. And he was probably doing everything we're doing right now. The Kriyas and the meditations and the chantings and so forth. But five hours a day, I was doing it wrong. 12 years. You see, my opinion is he wasn't doing it wrong. He discovered the next step. See, he discovered another step, a, diff a different mode. And when I first met him, he wore his socks wrong side out. He had argyle socks, a lot of threads hanging out. <laughs> and they were, they were different colors. And he pinned his coat together with a big pin. He, hung, he used to wash his shirts out in the sink and just hang them on a chair, put them on and wear them. Wore his, he always wore his watch on the outside of his shirt. 
He had a ring that he would wrap with white string because it was too big for him. In other words, he had no social conscience whatsoever. He didn't care. Not at all. So why did people come there? That's the big question. Why did they come? The answer is magnetism. What produces magnetism? It's produced by two things. And first, let me say that this thing that he was doing wrong, he had discovered another way of going. And this magnetism is produced by love and will. Now we don't, we're not talking about a sentimentality. That's not what love, that's our love. Spiritual love is an energy. That energy of love plus the energy of will produces magnetism. And that's all he did was willed himself to love all of us. That's, that miracle made all the rest possible. That's fantastic. See, a whole new thing. He said, when you become that, well, one day he said, when somebody comes up to you, and friend or enemy, and they strike you as hard as they can in the side of the face, and your first reaction is to love them, he said, then you got it. And he says, when you got it, you don't have to meditate anymore. You only love. You, you become an exerter of energy, a manipulator of energy. That's the whole secret. So when he started that, here we come with our glamours, our illusions, our hang-ups, our faults, our problems, all the mistreatments of him, each other, everywhere, all he did in return was love. That's a heck of a lesson. And that energy, you could always feel it, always working. No matter what you did, where you went, what went on, that energy was sustaining. And that's what kept you going. It was hard living with him. It was tough because he knew everything about you. You couldn't get away with your fears. You had to face them. You had to face into everything. Well, Debbie knows that. She was pretty close there. You couldn't ever get away. But then that constant love, you could work. You'd be so tired at the end of a day, you could hardly maneuver. But yet that buzzing inside, he would always be there, that you felt like you had accomplish something within yourself, and you didn't care. So, the first, right after that, we moved to, up to that upper room. We were having services up there. And he says, Jerry, you have to take the service, right out of the clear blue, and I, I didn't know nothing about it. I didn't want any part of it. And he insisted, and I thought, what the heck am I gonna do? I sat down. I don't know how I got through the service, but at the end he always went to the door and stood there and blessed everybody on the way out. So he was the first one up, stood by the door, and I was the first one to go out. He gave me a blessing, and he said, did you notice the record player wasn't plugged in? And I just got done playing two records. <laughs> yeah. So I went over and checked. Nobody else had moved, and then the plug was laying on the floor. <laughs> yeah. So when I first met him, I looked him over carefully because uh, to me, it was serious business. And I took about a month because you have to look past all the the baloney, and I asked him if, if he would be my teacher, and he wouldn't answer me, because you see, that's a two-way street. He knew 
what I didn't know how much work it took. And he knew uh, he had to find out whether I had the necessary tenacity to hold still. He told me once, he's, I, some of these people have been around here for 20 years, he's, I have yet to work on them because if I would make one motion, they would be gone. Run away. So that's the point. You hold still while the process, the process, the cleaning up. So he didn't answer me. And I asked him, will you teach me to love? And then he said, through me, you will, you will learn. See, that was, that was very interesting the way he put that. Through me, you will learn. And if I had known what lied ahead, I'd probably run away because uh, that's a tough road. Uh, some masters are in sciences, some in music, some have a role like he did. And he didn't care anything about the physical things. He didn't care about garbage and junk, although he had a lot of physical junk around him, a lot of that. All the chairs in our churches were always from the junkyard, and he would patch them up and make them work. Not because he was cheap, because he valued everything in life. Everything. Yeah, one day I saw him walking towards the, the barn, the church there, and he went and picked up, very gently, picked up weeds. He had a four or five in his hand, and he kind of blessed them, and he just laid them down and walked in. Everything was sacred. Everything was valuable. He had, when we tore his house down, all the walls were lined with leaves. And it, when we tore it down, he took all those leaves and he carted them all up north and reused them for something else, always. But mainly he would work with us every day, all day. It, the work day started sometimes 4.30 in the morning and it wouldn't get over till 10 or 11 at night. He would never leave us. Work right alongside and that energy always. And he would always put Two people that hard to get along, stick them right together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You always, yeah. And then he would pull strings on you. Just so that big house of his, he gathered materials from all over wherever he could find them. He'd haul them in when he got enough. He would build another a room on there. No plans, nothing. Just build a room on with whatever he had. And I think I counted 17 rooms in there at one time. And they used to call it the tar paper shack. And the city kept coming in trying to condemn it. Well, he had worked his way through grade school and high school, and he said two years of college, in which he took a little law. So he knew that they couldn't condemn his house until, unless somebody would let him inside. And then they would condemn it real quick. They had a, I saw, I was down at the city hall, they had a book on them this thick. Pictures, they, every way, trying to, <laughs> yeah. So one of the people that were renting rooms there, he had a wife and two kids. And he found out about that, and he says, I'm going to let him in my apartment. And Dr. George says, by morning, you'll be gone. <laughs> in the middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning, that guy took his family, jumped in his car, and drove away. And he called me up the next morning. He says, I need a little help. We went over there, and that place was absolutely alive with cockroaches. They were just coming out of the wall everywhere. He says, I guess we'll have to get a fumigator. So the guy came in, and he said, I never seen a cockroach like this. He says, there's none in this whole United States. He says, this is an Asian cockroach. He says, I've never seen anything like this before. <laughs> so 
we swept up about three quarters of a bushel of cockroaches. I've never seen any since. I never saw any before. We tore the whole building down. I didn't see one. And I said to him, did you specifically create that particular circumstance? He says, no. He says, I just knew that they would be gone by morning. How? I didn't know or I didn't care. But that set in the mind, see? And he told me one time, he says, Jerry, I'll show you how you do this. You sit down, and I said, he says, I plan my whole week, every detail. Who's going to call on me? What we're going to do? Everything. I plan the whole thing. And I said, I, I just get up and go. And it all just happens, just flows like magic. And then somebody comes to the door, oh, look at here, Sally's here. And see, he had planned that three or four days before. But it all worked just so smoothly. I think, uh, you want to talk a while? Yeah. Passing. For a specific reason, because she was with him the most, but his last experience was uh, what they call, in my opinion, what they call the crucifixion or the great renunciation, wherein every organ of his body was affected, every single one. He had yellow jaundice. He had, they, they tapped a gallon and a half of water out of him, his stomach, everything. And of course, that's, that's a process. And I said to him, he checked himself out of the hospital. He was skin and bones, just a rack of bones. I don't think he weighed 60 pounds. And he says, I want to go to your house for a couple days, which he did. And uh, I said, all the organs, every organ in your body has been affected so far. He says, yeah, except the heart. He says, and that goes tonight. And that's where I think that. Well, I wanted to start at the beginning, and I think I will. Um, when I was when I was twenty, and I was in college. Actually, it was after I was in college. It was summer vacation. I went out west with a couple girlfriends. We hitchhiked out there, and I met a very beautiful young man who in Oregon who took me backpacking up into the mountains and uh, the Cascade Mountains in Oregon. It was very beautiful there. And the whole time we were up there, three or four days, he talked about Yogananda, and he had a little book, Metaphysical Meditations. He read out of that every day to me. I had never heard of him, and uh, it was very beautiful. The time I spent with him was very beautiful. And that, that was part of my college summer vacation, and I came back, and um, I, I got a job, and found out uh, about a year later that the Moody Blues were playing in Milwaukee and I had a friend who was a fan of theirs and I said, would you hitchhike there with me and we can go see them. That was my reason for coming to Milwaukee. And uh, we spent the day getting there and someone dropped us off down at the lake. There were some people in a little VW bus there and, and we just, we'd been in cars all day long and we finally got there. We were relieved to be there. And these people came out of their little VW bus and said, oh, you must be new in town. Come and sit with us. We'd like to talk to you. Where are you from? And I really wanted to go see the water, and I, I didn't want to sit in another vehicle, but the friend I was with was a very gentle and uh, polite soul, and he nudged me, and he said, sure, we'll, we'll come and sit with you for a while. <coughs> and it ended up that the driver of the bus was a member of Dr. George's church, which at, the, at that point I didn't know. They gave us a tour of the city, and, and at the end of the tour, they said, um, Don, let's take them to the church. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's take them there. And they drove us to Dr. George's church, which from the outside looked like a little humble cottage or home. It was very unobtrusive in, in a neighborhood with humble homes. It didn't look too much like a church. It was pink, 
And we went inside, and, and uh, I'd never seen anything quite like that. It had beautiful little humble curtains on the windows and little pillows on the, on the pews and all the pictures of the masters on the front, which I recognized Yogananda from the person who had introduced me to, to Yogananda's teachings. And um, naive as I was, I walked right up to Dr. George's chair and sat in it and looked through the books that were on the table next to it, and there was Yogananda's book again. And the people who had brought us there had their eyes closed and were meditating. I didn't know very much about meditation. But boy, I could feel something in that church, and that there was that picture of that master again. And the person who had let us in, the owner of the bus, had, he had the key, and I thought, well, he must know something about this place. So the rest of the night, I questioned him quite a bit, talked to him, and he ended up putting us up for the night. He had a copy of the autobiography on his coffee table, which I decided I better read this book. It keeps coming to me. And uh, he, he took us to the concert, brought us back, gave us a place to stay, and drove us out of town to a good place to hitchhike back home from. And I asked him for his name and address and began corresponding with him. Right after that happened, he, he, he was a member of Dr. George's church, but he moved in with Dr. George right after that happened. So I was corresponding with him at Dr. George's house. And I had a million questions, and uh, he had very good answers for me, and it was very intriguing. And I said, I'd like to come down on my spring break. I'd like to come down and have a little visit there and see what you're all about. So I did do that, and I, I met Dr. George very briefly. Um, he blessed me on the way out of the church, but I didn't have much contact with him. And subsequent to that, I had some very interesting dreams. Um, I was going to go to Europe. I was going to spend my next summer in Europe, and I had saved up for that. But I had this dream that I was, I was walking through a park in Paris, and there were four paths converging in this park. I was on one of them. And off on one of these other paths, there was a park bench with the sweetest old man in an overcoat sitting there. And as I was walking, I, I couldn't help but notice him, and I, I was impelled to walk over and see him. And he said, sit down, I've been waiting for you. And I sat down, and he had, this part I never figured out, he had two brown paper packages under his arm, two, two bundles wrapped in string. And I said, well, what have you got there? What is that? He said, oh, those are for you. I said, well, what is that? He said, yeah, those are for you. And that's all he would say about it. <laughs> and that was the end of the dream, but that dream stayed with me for a long time because it wasn't like a dream. It was like I was I was there with that sweet little old man, and he was so sweet. He had a sweetness that I couldn't resist. Well, a little while after that, I, I had another dream, and uh, I saw the high-rise high bridge in Milwaukee, and there was a body of water under it, and I was in that body of water on a boat with Dr. George, and he was standing up with a megaphone yelling, stroke, and I was rowing the boat. <laughs> there, was, there was another passenger in the boat, but I was doing all the work, and... Uh, it was very strenuous, and, and he just kept looking at me and telling me to stroke, stroke, stroke. A very strenuous dream. I think I woke up tired from that one. <laughs> and and the, he had a power. In that dream, he had a power. It wasn't the sweetness. There was a power there. And in fact, I think he looked like Yul Brynner in that dream, <laughs> which was a person I associated with a lot of power at that time. And uh, shortly after that, in my correspondence with Don, he said, you're so interested in all of this. Why don't you come down here? Why don't you move here and spend some time with us? We have a, a retreat up north, and we're doing some carpentry there. We could use some extra help. And uh, oh, I thought, oh, well, I live here in Minnesota. I'm not going to Milwaukee. But uh, eventually, that's, that's what I decided I was going to do. I began saving. Instead of going to France, I was going to go to Milwaukee. And I would try it out, and I'd see how how it went and how I would like it. And I had visions of people putting up barns and working together like the Amish do. And, and I thought that could be a lot of fun. I'll try that for a little while, and if I like it, I'll stay. So the following June, uh, Don came and picked me up. I had all my belongings, and he drove me to Milwaukee. And it was the funniest thing. The closer we got there, there was, with, almost with every mile, there was a vibration building in that car, and 
and I could feel something coming over me and, and building all the way there. And we pulled into his driveway. He was out, uh, he and another person were un unloading some things off of a trailer he had brought back from up north. And uh, he said, oh, oh, you've come. He said, where are you going to stay? And I said, well, I have enough money to find my own place until I can get a job. And in the meantime, Don said I could stay at the church. He said, you stay with me. And I said, oh, I, I couldn't impose. I, I, I won't do that. And he looked at me and he said, you stay with me. And I knew there was no saying no, so that, that's where I ended up. I, I, did, I did stay with him. And I didn't stay for a couple of weeks. I stayed for seven years <laughs> until he passed. And it was, it was an adventure. Uh, I think the first time I actually sat, spent some time in a room with him, he... I don't know how to put it except to say that maybe he revealed himself to me and I saw I saw a presence of great power and beauty. And as Jerry said, you knew that he he could read you like a book. You were you were naked before him. He knew all your thoughts. He knew all your experiences. You were totally open. But you were aware of it as well. And I think that was one of the things that uh, being in Dr. George's presence did, and that's, I think, why he said you don't have to meditate when you're with me. Being with him, you were acutely aware of who you were, where your thoughts were, what your motives were, how you were responding, how you were reacting. There was no question. You were aware. And I think those are the things we need to know in order to grow. We need to know who we are, what we really think, what our motives really are, what really makes us tick. If we, don't, if we don't see that, I don't think we can get rid of it and we can't go beyond it. And being, he always said, being in my presence, you don't have to meditate. And I think, I, I, don't, I don't say that I, I have a lot of awareness or, or understanding, but I, I think that's maybe a, a lot about what meditation is, is being able to be that aware, that acutely aware at all times. And in his presence, that was undeniable. There was a, he, he, had, he had signs around him of, they were very subtle, but um, I noticed from the first time I met him, there was a fragrance around him. Did you ever notice that, Haley? There was a floral fragrance around him, very subtle, very, very subtle. His house had that. There, the first time I walked into his house, excuse me, his house, I noticed uh, a wonderful, subtle, delightful floral fragrance. It was always there. Very uplifting, just as if you burn some incense. The uh, room begins to smell very sweet and it's very uplifting. And it, it wasn't as gross as incense. It was much more subtle and fine. Much more subtle and fine than that. So that, that was always around him. But he had, like Jerry and, and uh, Mary Dee said, there, were, there was a, a power and a vibration and a love around him that you could cut it with a knife. It was it was thick. It was it was beautiful, but he didn't always manifest that. If if he wanted to, he could he could manifest great great power and great will. And uh, I think a couple of us experienced on a couple occasions that will. There was no matching wills with Dr. George. He had a will of I can't even say a will of iron. He had an incredible will and. Uh, incredible power around him. And can we take a little break? I'm the... In 1978, Dr. George became very ill and had to admit himself into a hospital. He, um, he admitted himself into the VA hospital. He had been in the Army for a couple months after, after college. ROTC paid his college expenses. <coughs> So he was eligible for the VA. Thank you very much. So he was in the, he was in the hospital there and, and quite ill. He asked me to come every day, and he asked me to read the path to him, Kriyananda's book, The Path. And there was a section in there where Yogananda was temporarily paralyzed, but he was asked to speak at some public gathering, which he accepted. 
and his disciples got him into a car and drove him to the reception, which I believe was an outdoor place, and they wanted to help him out of the car, but he brushed them aside and got right up and walked onto the, strode onto the stage and, and gave his speech for however long, a couple hours or whatever, and walked back to the car and collapsed and went back into the state of paralysis. Kriyananda talked about that in the book. And I was reading to that, reading that to Dr. George one night, and he said, he wasn't paralyzed. He wasn't sick. He was taking on the karma of his students. He was helping his students. That's what that was. And then he was quiet for a minute and he said, if Yogananda can do it, I can do it. And I knew that that's why he was there. That's why he was ill. So I came and read to him every day until we finished the book. Towards the end there, he, um, he had developed pneumonia and he was having a very difficult time breathing. And he uh, seemed to be unconscious and somewhat delirious. And they had him sitting up in the bed because I think with pneumonia they have to drain the liquid so you can breathe, you have to sit up. And he was sitting there uh, delirious and, and looking very ill and, and I was in tears. And all of a sudden he looked at me, he grabbed my hand and looked at me and he said, you are the Christ, you are love, repeat it. And he, a power went out of his eyes into me, and, and, and I, w I was shocked out of my, my emotions. And I, I began to repeat that mentally to myself and sit next to him and repeat it. And I think I did it for an hour or so, and I got tired and, and stopped. And, and here he was all delirious and, and sitting there. And all of a sudden he sat up and he said, I didn't tell you to stop. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I, I think I was there five hours, and I think he made me do it the whole five hours. And uh, my head was swooning. I had a headache, and I was fighting off the emotions for the state that he was in. And then the nurse came in and said, it's time for you to leave. So I got up, and the room was dark. It was evening. It was May, and, and uh, it got dark around 7 o'clock or something. So the room was dark, and I started to leave the room. And over my shoulder, I heard, Debbie, and it sounded like music. I don't mean that it was sung, but the tones were like music. And I turned and looked over my shoulder, and the room was all light. And Dr. George was, Dr. George was hovering above the bed. And he didn't have the same clothes on. He was robed or something. And he looked into my eyes, and he said, I love you. And there was a blue, like an ocean, that came from his eyes. I don't know how to describe it. But he very rarely would look into your eyes. He, he hid his, his greatness. Most of the time he was very humble. But my eyes met his eyes and there was this, like a blue ocean. It was astral, but it, it's out, the only way I can describe it, like a blue lake or a blue ocean between us. And there he was shining. And the nurse said it from the other station, it's time to go, and I had to walk out. And that, that's probably the most unique experience that he gave me. Um, he had told me a couple weeks before that, before he got very, very sick, that every morning at 3 o'clock he went into samadhi, into the breathless state, and no one was around and they didn't bother him and they didn't know, they thought he was just sleeping. And he would go into samadhi every morning from 3 until 6 when they came in to get him up. Well, the next morning we got a phone call about 4 o'clock, Dr. George passed. And I, I said, thank you for the call. And, and I thought to myself, he's in samadhi, and they just stumbled upon him, and they think he's passed, and he's not. But, but it was true, he had passed. So that was his, his final blessing to me, was that, that vision of whatever it was. I, I still don't understand it, but it was, it was quite beautiful and quite different from the man I had left a few seconds ago, sick in the bed. When I was about seven years old, my sister, whose name was Gail, was about nine, and she was deaf from birth. She was totally deaf from birth. She had, uh, she was stone deaf. She had a nerve injury at birth. 
She went to a private school for the deaf in Minnesota. And when I was nine, my mother and dad came back with Gail from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and they found out that she had an incurable eye disease. She was going blind. She had tunnel vision, retinitis pigmentosis. And I remember seeing my dad, who was a very, very tough, strong man, cry like a baby. And he, they were helpless to deal. They did not know what to do about this, and it was very painful. And over the years, my sister uh, did well, and she kept on going, but her radius of vision kept getting narrower and legally blind in Minnesota is a 20 degree radius of vision and her radius of vision was about 46 degrees of vision. And uh, I asked my mother at that time what to do about this and my mother said, well, you got to pray to God. And so I tried praying to God and when I was 12 I had a spiritual experience and God called me to be a minister. And I was raised Presbyterian, and so I really got active in Presbyterian youth work, and I uh, was planning on either being a medical missionary or a minister. And I read books about Dr. Tom Dooley, the medical missionary <coughs> over in Vietnam and so forth. And meanwhile, while life kind of went on. But then the organized religion didn't make too much sense to me. And I would ask preachers, I'd say, uh, do you know God? And they would say, well, you've got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got to believe in the Bible, and so forth. And I said, well, I don't have any problems with that, but, I mean, do you know God? You would think, you know, that you could know God, that nothing else makes any sense. And then it also used to just nag at me, why did my sister have all those difficulties, and why was I so just dumb lucky? And... It, it was a great puzzlement to me. And one day, my, my mother used to go to a prayer group, and the leader of that prayer group was a, a spiritual healer in St. Paul named Ed Jennings. And Ed used to go over, he, he I'll tell you a funny story about Ed. He, he, was, he was on his deathbed in St. Joseph's Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota in 1954. He was in a coma, and he, had, he was dying and it was inoperable, and he was, wasn't that old of a guy, maybe in his early 50s or so. And all of a sudden, Ed told me, he said, I was looking down at my body, and God said, Ed, you are not the body, you are spirit. And then he was back in his body, and his body was healed, and he walked out of the hospital. And from that time on, he was one of those gifted people who had the ability to spiritually heal people every now and again. And what frustrated Ed was that he would pray for 25 people, and nothing would happen. He'd pray until he was blue in the face and nothing would happen. And then all of a sudden, wham, you know, something would happen. There would be a miracle. So it puzzled Ed why some people were healed and some people weren't. So he went over to this uh, yoga. Yo he called them a bunch of yogis over in Minneapolis. And there was a guy named Bob Raymer who was running. <laughs> running the, and a guy named Jose Trevino was there. And uh, so Ed went a few times and he got this book called The Autobiography of a Yogi. And he said, well, he said, it, didn't make, it wasn't really his path, but it made a lot of sense to him, and that's why he accepted reincarnation. And that was what he figured out. So when, when my mother went to his prayer group to try to get healing for my sister, he gave her this copy of the Autobiography of a Yogi, and she gave it to me when I was 17. And I read that book, and gone. And then I read the fine print. Yogananda had passed away <laughs> in 1952. That was a bummer. And so I tried to meditate, and I was trying my best to meditate, and I meditated and meditated, and I saw one practical benefit. When I was a junior in high school playing basketball, I was awful, just a disaster. And like I get out in the court, and I just, you know, I was nervous, and I did, didn't feel it. Well, at, when I was a senior, I'd meditate before every game. And boy, I'd meditate, and boy, I'd go out there, and ooh, I, you know, I liked it. I, was, I knew what was going on. It was really fun. So that was my first outer positive benefit from meditation. And, but I kept meditating, and kept meditating, and I wasn't getting the results. 
that I was looking for. I just wasn't feeling all this bliss that was advertised in the books. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I, I determined that I needed to go to India to find a real yogi. I, Gail and I took, Gail was interested in metaphysics also, and Gail and I took the train to Chicago in 1964. I was 20, and we went to see Joel Goldsmith, the metaphysical teacher, because we had, my mother had gotten all of her books and we read all of his books, and, and so I went to see him, and you couldn't get near the guy. There was all these people around, you couldn't even get up near him, and, and so finally I, I gave a five spot to the bellhop, a black guy, and he told me where the room was. So you have to do anything in the spiritual path. <laughs> and I, I, went up, I went up and I staked, staked out Joel Goldsmith's room. And I just basically sat there reading a book, waited for him to show up. I figured he'd come there sooner or later. And so sure enough, he finally came. And I went up to him and I just said, excuse me, I don't mean to bother you. I just want to know one thing. Are you my guru? And he looked at me very quizzically. He was a very nice man, kindly. And he said, no. I said, thank you. That's all I need to know. <laughs> so... Uh, it's a funny thing, he died about three months later. And Yogananda used to have a room at Encinitas for Joel Goldsmith. And Joel Goldsmith was welcome there at any time. Well, uh, I decided that I needed to go to India to find a real yogi. And I arranged for a scholarship to spend my junior year at the University of Benares, the holy city of India. And I was all set to go. I had my passport, I had my shots, I had everything. And uh, I told all my buddies, that I was going to India to find a real yogi. And of course, they thought I was remarkably daft. <laughs> and uh, I was all set to go. And I was, in fact, I was five days away from leaving. And I just happened to see this Ed Jennings. And Ed said to me, he said, what? why are you going to India? And I said, I'm going there to find a real yogi. He said, well, you know, I know a real yogi. And he's in Milwaukee. He's very unorthodox. And his name is Dr. George. And he said, he healed my wife, of alcoholism. And what happened was Ed took the train down to see Dr. George and asked George, he said, would you pray for my wife? And Dr. George sat him down there and they didn't move a muscle for two hours. He sat and then Ed, uh, Dr. George got up and tapped Ed right here. And he said, your wife will be okay. And Ed said every time he closed his eyes on the train back, he saw a white cross in front of his uh, forehead and his wife was healed from the booze. And uh, I verified that with her years later, and she had never touched, never touched a drink after that. Well, I said, where is this Dr. George? And all he knew was his name, uh, Dr. George. He didn't know his last name, he didn't have a telephone, and he didn't know his address. So I figured, oh well, Milwaukee isn't that big, I'll find him. So I, I got him, <laughs> I, I, I got him, got him in my car and I, I drove to Milwaukee and I drove all night and I got in about six in the morning and uh, I stopped at this near the Wisconsin State Fairgrounds on the, on the interstate there and I went and I had a cup of, uh, cup of coffee or something and a little breakfast and I went to the payphone and lo and behold, the infinite way Joel Goldsmith's group was listed in the phone book. And I called that person and that person said, uh, do you know what I said or do you know a dr. George and she says oh yes she says uh, but he doesn't have a phone but I'll give you the name of of his assistant his name is Jerry Neal and so I got Jerry's number and I called Jerry and Jerry said well yeah uh, he says uh, he's on his way up to Friendship Wisconsin and I says where's that so Jerry gave me directions over the phone and I drove up to Friendship Wisconsin I got there about 11 o'clock and there was I found this place and it was the darnest looking place I ever saw in my life and uh, so, <laughs> and so I, I sat there and, and I waited all day. I waited and waited and waited and drove into town and had my last hamburger on this earth in Friendship, Wisconsin. <laughs> and uh, finally about 6 o'clock, Dr. George showed up. And he had this big, huge concrete pipe on a trailer with an old green pickup truck. And he pulled in and... Uh, I took one look at him and gong. That was the second gong in my life. The first one was reading Yogananda's book and the second gong was taking one look at Dr. George. And so I helped him take that concrete pipe off, unload this pickup truck 
and I, I, I was thinking, what in the world is all this stuff in this pickup truck? There was probably at least 25% of all the artifacts in the history of the human race in the back of that <laughs> pickup truck. And we loaded them into a building in which was the other 75%. <laughs> so I figured, oh well, what the heck, you know, I mean, this is the yogi business. And so, uh, and so that night, Normal, right. <laughs> That night was the first time in my life that I felt what I was looking for. And I knew that I had landed a real one. So the next day, I said to Dr. George, I said, I would like you to be my teacher. He said, no, no. He says, I think you should go to India and find a real yogi. He <laughs> 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 really did. So I started to argue with him. and, and uh, he says, you're weak emotionally. He says, you don't know anything about life. And I said, well, I says, you know, I mean, I'm not that weak. And so, you know, so I argued with him and argued with him. And finally, he kind of smiled. And you could always tell when Dr. George, Dr. George, like no other being on this earth, uh, with a possible exception of Sai Baba, Dr. George, he had that gleam. And you know what I'm talking about. He got that gleam. Zzz. And you could just see. And he said to me, he says, Yogananda sent you to me. I knew you were coming. Excuse me. So then <laughs> I, <coughs> I drove back to Minnesota and I packed up uh, everything I had and I moved down to Milwaukee. And then I unserm Dr. George said, you move in with Jerry. So I <laughs> show, showed up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> and I landed in Jerry's house. Unannounced. Unannounced. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. George never said a word to Jerry. <laughs> so uh, now back to my sister. When she was in this school for the deaf, there were about 30 students in this private school for the deaf. And there was two old maid sisters, Faye and Dina Allen, who taught a revolutionary method of uh, <coughs> deaf education. They taught them to read lips and to speak. So when you communicated with my sister, you talked like this, so she could read your lips. And she never learned the sign, sign language. And uh, she, she told my mother and I uh, for a long time, that she said whenever she was very lonely and things were very, very hard for her being away from her family and her concern of, you know, just, I mean, how, how would you like to be deaf and 11 years old and, or whatever? She said that this very kind man would stand at the end of her bed and he would tell her, I don't know if I'll be able to get this up. <clears throat> he told her, I love you and everything is fine, and you are all right. And he would just take care of her. And many, and those years later, when uh, I was in Milwaukee, and I told my mother and sister about finding Dr. George, they came down a few weeks later, and my mother said to my, uh, excuse me, my sister said to my mother and I, she said, that's the man. And so, uh, Meeting Dr. George was, was quite unusual. And I, in looking back at my life, I would say that the, that the first four years of me being with Dr. George were probably the hardest years that I have ever gone through in my life. And uh, it was very, 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 very painful on one side. But on the other side, uh, it, was, it was easily probably the most beautiful time of my life, too. And, oh, thanks. And Dr. George uh, was just unbelievable, and he was so unusual. He built, we built these buildings, and I know you've heard about these buildings, and I'll just give you a little, couple little artifacts. Uh, this place on 20th Street that Dr. George used to have, uh, I don't know how to describe it, and he built this place in the 1920s and the 1930s out of used lumber, used nails, used anything he could find. It had absolutely no it was totally and completely ramshackle with tar paper here, tar paper there, uh, every roof, roof in the whole place, 
place leaked. He had concrete basements, cement block, this, that. And uh, he absolutely met no building code on earth. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm about to tell you, I believe, is the greatest miracle, in my opinion, that great beings have pulled off, to my knowledge, <laughs> is that that building was condemned in 1936 or 35, one of, I can't remember which one. It was condemned in 1935. And you know, my uncle used to be the head building inspector in the city of Minneapolis. And those building inspectors and health departments, they have more power than God and two presidents. <laughs> they really do. I mean, you know, a flick of the pen, bang, it's gone. And that, that whole monstrosity was condemned in 1935. And in 1964, I witnessed a, a, a Milwaukee policeman drive up, tap a you know, thing on the, uh, you know, whatnot. And I, and I said to Dr. George, I said, how? This place been condemned for 28 years? And, and he, <laughs> how, how do you live here? And he, his eyes gleamed. <laughs> he, he, he did the old eye gleaming routine. And he said, Master wants me to stay here. <laughs> and I will tell you, if you've got Dr. George and Yogananda on one side of an issue, you can kiss goodbye what's ever on the other side. <laughs> 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 that, I mean, that, and they built this brand new junior high school right across the street. And now where this place was, was 50 blocks south of downtown Milwaukee. Now, this is in a major city, 50 blocks from downtown. And uh, they built a brand new junior high school right across the street. And Dr. George was real concerned about the kids going through there, not that they were going to hurt anything. He was concerned about them getting hurt, you know, and so forth, because, boy, talk, if I was a kid and that place was across the street, you've got to be kidding me. I would have been looking all over that place. But anyway, uh, Dr. George said, I wonder what I can do about getting, keeping these kids out of here. And he said, find me a hammer. So I went, and I got him a hammer. And he looked and looked around, oh, this junk, I mean, every single thing. And he's, he's looking, and he finds the most moth-eaten old cap you ever saw in your life, you know, shakes off the dust. He says, give me the hammer. So he puts the nail, he used to put nails, you know, in his mouth. He goes up and he finds this tree and he hammers that cap in the tree. And then he smiles and his eyes gleam and he says, that'll do it. And I will, <laughs> and I uh, never ever did another kid go on that property until, <laughs> and I have, I have never ever, I have never figured that one out. <laughs> when I went bankrupt, I was, when I was, when I went bankrupt years ago, I was thinking maybe I could put a cap up on my tree in my front yard and keep the bill collectors away. You know? <laughs> so years went on and uh, <clears throat> one time I was, uh, I was working a midnight to eight job running a computer and the sh police called me and about four something in the morning they came and my boss called me and told me to shut down the computer and the police came and picked me up and my house had burned down and my sister uh, died in the fire. And uh, so I asked Dr. George, you know, for assistance to understanding this and he went. That's what he went. So every day for two and a half years I asked for guidance. Why? Every single day, and I didn't want to hear it from some outer words, I wanted to see it. So it took me two and a half years, and I was sitting up in Friendship, Wisconsin, out in the woods, and I, uh, there's some dead oak trees there, and I, uh, and I sat down just to relax, and a deer, a deer ran right by me. And I got it, and, and I got this vision, and I saw, why and how and where. And it was, ex her life was extraordinarily beautiful from the spiritual. And she made it, in a sense. It was her last life. And, and uh, she, was, she was a great being, great, great being. And she said to me at that time, she said, I always want you to view me as uh, completely perfect. And she said, I never want you to be sad about that life. It was beautiful. And so ever since then, uh, she is extremely close to me uh, on the inner plane.
And I will tell you, anytime I've had problems, uh, she uh, has always helped me. And uh, the next spring in 1968, uh, in March or April, I got this premonition that I was going to die. And I really felt strongly that I was going to leave the earth. And as you remember, 1968 was very possibly one of the worst years. Bobby Kennedy was shot, Martin Luther King was shot, the Tet Offensive over in Vietnam, and everything. It, it was, you know, terrible terror. It, it, was, it was not a very good year. And I remember that uh, I felt I was going to die. So I had some property, and I donated it. I gave it to the church. I settled all my effects. I wrote a will and gave it to my mother. And uh, in 